Do you guys want to know how to sell a toilet for $1 million? My name is Jay Martin. I'm an investor and the host of The Jay Martin Show. And today we're going to talk about the art industry on my weekly rant. Now, if you're a subscriber, you know that what I do is interview some of the world's brightest minds when it comes to capital allocation and money flow. I'm diving into the strategies of the best investors with the best track records that I can find with the selfish intention of stealing their strategies and apply that which works for me with my risk tolerance, my time horizon, and my available capital. Now, of the wealthiest guests that I have on the show, like the True Billionaires Club, across the board, all of them have allocated some percent of their portfolio to the art industry. And so it's just made me very curious as to why and how. Now, this doesn't mean you have to buy a $100 million piece of art, a $10 million, a $1 million piece of art to participate. There's actually smaller int entry points that I've been uncovering. But before I push any capital to any new asset class, what I want to do first is understand the macro, right? How is anything valued? What motivates purchasing, right? How are price points protected? How do they rise? How do they fall? And so I've been diving into the art industry. And I just got to say, this is fascinating. And I had to write about it this week in my newsletter and share some of these stories with you. So <clears throat> let me start by telling a story. All right. In 2004, there was a piece by an artist named Marcel Duchamp. It was called Fountain. And this piece in 2004 was created in 1917. But in 2004, it was voted to be the most influential piece of art during the 20th century by 500 selected British art world professionals. Now, just for context, that means it beat second place, which was a Picasso, and third place, which was an Andy Warhol. Now, Fountain, this piece, was created in 1917 by the champ and was described by the art world as being a wonder. Everybody who saw it knows it's beautiful. It was some kind of a cross between a Buddha and a veiled woman. These are real quotes from the art world at that time. So. You want to know how the most influential piece of art during the 20th century was created? <clears throat> well, Marcel Duchamp purchased a urinal from an iron workshop on Fifth Avenue, New York, brought it back to his studio and reoriented it 90 degrees. He, he bought a toilet and pushed it over. And that's exactly what this piece looks like. But replicas of this piece, not even the original, replicas have sold at Sotheby's auction in New York for as high as $1.7 million, right? Human beings are fucking crazy and I just love it. And so art really bleeds beyond people's sensibilities. And this is reaffirmed by the existence of a very healthy multi-billion dollar black market, which blew my mind because as I understood the value of art, it's in its presentation utility. And if the art is stolen and can't be presented. How on earth is it attractive at all to an investor? But it is, right? You can look at cash, gold, Bitcoin, and rationalize those thefts because those assets can be laundered back into the world in exchange for par value. But a Mona Lisa is only valuable as a Mona Lisa in its original shape, recognizable. But that doesn't stop some of the most sensational art heists from being accomplished. And I want to share one with you. The most infamous art heist of my generation occurred in 2010. And I'm going to butcher the names of these artists because I'm not an aficionado. But five pieces were stolen from the Museum of Modern Art in Paris. It was a Matisse, a Picasso, a Braque, a Laguerre, and a Modigliani. Now, these pieces collectively were valued at over $100 million. And the thief was well known. His name was Tomic, but he was better known by his moniker, Spider-Man, because he had a rap sheet of scaling up buildings, breaking in through windows. And, you know, it started when he was 10 years old. He climbed through the window of a library and stole several hundred-year-old books. But in 2010, under the cover of night, Tomic scaled the Museum of Modern Art in Paris, carrying a black cloth with him to disguise himself as a window curtain, and then spent six nights preparing his entry point, a window that he modified for six nights until he felt comfortable entering the building, where he then stole five pieces worth over $100 million. Now, he was caught, he served eight years in jail, but the art was never recovered. It's still out there, somewhere on the black market, being enjoyed by somebody. And oddly enough, often photographs of stolen art resurface. Just last year, a Dutch art detective in the Netherlands named Arthur Brand started receiving photographs of a, of a stolen Van Gogh. And it's as if the thief just wants someone to know that this piece of art is being enjoyed somewhere. It's the craziest things because gold and Bitcoin investors often get credited as being the sensational ones. But honestly, they've got nothing on the art industry. Now, in addition, there's some very pragmatic reasons to invest in art. It's arguably the least correlated asset class. 
the price of art, the value of art doesn't seem to be affected at all by interest rates, market crashes, depressions, or even war. It doesn't seem to matter what kind of chaos hits the world. Art prices just do their own thing, right? During World War II, from 1937 to 1940, you know, the all shares index of London stock prices crashed by 50%. Same thing in the US from 1937 to 38, the S&P 500 crashed 50%, hitting actually an all-time low in 1942. Whereas the May Moses Art Index actually shot up by 130% from 1937 to 1946. And you'll find similar non-correlated price performances <clears throat> during all major combat events of the 20th century. In more recent history, from 1995 to 2001, contemporary art prices outpaced the S&P 500 total return by 164%. From 2000 to 2018, the Art Price 100 Index, which is a weighting of the top 100 performing artists that's determined by their prices at recent auctions, outpaced the S&P 500 by 180%. So despite this being a very tried and tested protection of wealth, I lack the skill set to value art effectively because art isn't valued by weight or utility or carrots or even quality. It's valued by something called provenance, which is to say who owned it and where has it been exhibited, right? This speaks to the street credibility of art. Now, obviously a famous name will always carry a premium like a Monet or a Picasso, but truly when it comes to art, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, or you could almost say, the beholder determines the beauty, as is the case of Fountain. It was a urinal, but the street loved it, and so the price shot up. That's how a toilet became the most influential piece of art of the 20th century. The street absolutely loved it. Now, I don't care if this is ridiculous, because here's the thing. As I said, without fail, all of the guests on my show in that Billionaires Club have allocated some percent of their portfolio to art. Now, simultaneously, over the last year, all of my guests have been de-risking, right? Where we're looking at Grant Williams or David Rubenstein, anybody in the middle. The smartest money that I've had on my show has been taking cash off the table and putting it in safe haven asset classes. So this is because nobody knows how the rest of the decade is gonna play out. I think it's gonna be more of the same. The 2020s will be how the 2020s have been, a continuum of just unprecedented chaos and crises, right? Nobody knows what's gonna happen. Nobody knows whether the Fed will be able to raise rates as many times as they claim. No one knows how that's gonna impact inflation. No one knows whether food and fuel prices are gonna jump 50%. No one knows how the Bitcoin or gold price will respond. Nobody knows if a real estate super tax is coming. None of this stuff, right? And when nobody knows Knows what's about to happen, it's very important to keep your options open. And so because of scenarios like that, I take a hard look at my safe haven asset classes and try to diversify those as much as possible. So look, I've recently began looking at this program called Masterworks. I'm sure you've heard of it because they're sponsoring all kinds of podcasts and YouTube channels recently. It's essentially a blockchain enabled fractional investing platform that in theory democratizes access to blue chip art because I'm not gonna buy an eight figure Monet. I'm just not gonna do it, right? I can't do it, right? But if I wanna allocate some capital to art, Masterworks gives me that opportunity. So I'm taking this program for a test drive. Now what Masterworks does is they buy art qualified similar to the Art Price 100 Index, right? based on the artist's price performance over the previous few years and their forecasted price performance over the next few. Now, I can invest in a minority ownership of a Monet or an Andy Warhol or a Banksy, right? And Masterworks buys the piece, holds it for three to 10 years, and then sells it. And as a minority owner, I participate in that upside. Alternatively, if I want liquidity in advance, I can purchase my shares in that Monet and then try to sell it next week on their secondary market. That's not gonna be my strategy here. I don't have as much confidence in that, but as a place to park capital for a multi-year long-term hold, I think this is attractive, but I'm just beginning to dive into it. I'd love to know what you think. I'm gonna put a link beneath this video so you can check it out and please let me know because more and more of my guests are touting this de-risking strategy. I'm following suit. They're advocating for more alternative asset classes Hence my recent interest in arable land and art. Now with inflation at 8%, slowing economic growth and nearly every firm from Goldman to BlackRock projecting stock returns under 5% until 2025, it's getting harder and harder to find value and thinking outside the box is paramount. So let me know what you think and have an awesome afternoon.